Well, welcome to Brooks River in Katmai National Park, Alaska. This is Mike Fitz, your resident naturalist with explore.org, the world's largest live nature cam network. And my co-host for today's play-by-play -play on August 9, 2021, is Ranger Naomi Boak from Katmai National Park. Ranger Naomi, thanks for being here once again. Um, it's great to be here. And did you say it's August 9th? Doesn't this look like July 9th? <laughs> It, it certainly does. And I think that's going to be a, a, uh, a point of conversation during today's uh, broadcast. And if you've, if you've never joined one of these before, uh, I'm at my home base in Maine and Ranger Naomi is at Brooks River in Katmai, but she's not outside standing on the wildlife platforms. So we are connecting remotely and watching the webcams through our computer. And I'm also acting as sort of like the producer of this broadcast. So if you're wondering who's bringing up the weird images from time to time, that would be me. We do have some wonderful camera operators, however, who are looking uh, around for the brown bears and they're gonna try to give us a heads up on what they see from time to time. We'll also have the opportunity to look at different camera views. So we'll go not only look at the falls, of course, but we'll go downstream to the riffles, depending on bear activity there. This camera is located about 100 yards downstream of Brooks Falls. And then we'll also go to our river watch camera. This camera is located uh, about three quarters of a mile or so downstream of the falls as the water flows. But Brooks Falls is going to be where most of the activity is today. And if you're not familiar with Brooks River and the location itself, as always, let's start out today's broadcast uh, with just a quick view of the river itself and where that is. So Katmai is located about 300 miles southwest of Anchorage, Alaska. And Brooks Falls bisects Brooks River. Brooks River is about a mile and a half long. And in this view, it flows from left to right. And along with the National Park Service, Explore.org hosts and maintains several webcams at the river. The signal from those webcams is sent wirelessly to a couple of radio repeaters on the top of Dumpling Mountain. And then those repeaters send the signal to the small town of King Salmon, about 30 miles away. Going back to the river though, for just a second to give you an overview of where those different cameras are in this uh, Google Earth image, uh, Brooks Falls on the left-hand side of the screen, the Riffles camera just downstream of there. And then we'll also be going to the Riverwatch camera uh, downstream as well. We have several questions uh, queued up that were submitted in advance through Ask Your Bear Cam question. You can find a link to that on the, the left-hand side of the page below the live camera screen. So, so please look for that. I do look at all of the questions, even though we don't have time necessarily to answer them all. And Naomi and I also have a Q&A tomorrow from 5 to 7 p.m. in the comments below the live camera feed on the Brooks Live Chat channel. So you can join us there to ask us um, more of those uh, questions. But this is live. Uh, we have a, a few things that, you know, of course, we're looking forward to talking about, uh, Naomi, but we never really know what to expect in these broadcasts. But again, I think one of the big storylines is just the number of bears that you or that we've been seeing on the cameras. And you last night, you said you saw about 30 bears, including cubs, in your line of sight at Brooks Falls. Yeah. I mean, um, I was there from about, I'd say, 5.30 to 8.30 last night, and it was just amazing. I mean, um, this is the time of year where usually the sockeye salmon run is over, and most of the bears have gone to their secret hideaways in, in small creeks and rivers nearby where they can find small spawned out salmon, or, and but... Um, they're hanging out and um, there were a lot of salmon. I did a salmon count, which is uh, something we do when we're working on the falls platform. We try and count how many salmon are jumping uh, per minute. And I counted over a hundred per minute, which is a July kind of count, Mike. This is a, a time warp here. <laughs> it is in, in a sense. and. I want to emphasize that to our audience, especially new bear cam viewers. If you haven't been watching the cameras for a long time, maybe you just started last year or started watching this year, the typical pattern of bear activity in the middle of August at Brooks River is one of kind of scarcity as far as bears go. There's fish around, but the salmon migration is kind of over typically by this time of the year, at least for sockeye salmon. 
And we see bears dispersing away from Brooks River to fish in different locations. That doesn't seem to be the case this year, although there have been bears that have moved away. There certainly were bears that we saw in July that we're not seeing right now. But yeah, there's a lot of bears around for this time of the year. Uh, in fact, there's a, an old you know, Brooks Camp trip planner, I think, on, the, on Katmai's uh, YouTube channel. And I hosted that when I was a ranger at the park. And, and I, during, at, at one point in there, I have this calendar that I pull up and be like, when can you see bears at Brooks River? And in August, I was like, no, don't try to plan to see bears at Brooks River in August. But maybe we're seeing a sort of like a regime change in a sense. I don't know if it's that bears are learning to fish at Brooks Falls in September or if it's a product of like larger or later salmon runs. But since really 2016, we've been seeing a pattern in more bears sticking around in August. And maybe it's a, a product of those two things. But really great to see this right now. Uh, 128 on the lip. We have 284 over by the boulders. Walker, 151 behind them, kind of closer to the far wall. Uh, Otis had a marathon fishing session today. Naomi, he was in the water for, uh, you know, something like 20 hours uh, <laughs> taking naps and also trying to fish in, in between. So it really just incredible stuff. Yeah, I think um, another thing that has happened over the past few years is um, seems like there were um, a number of family groups kind of taking over the fall sometime in August um, because maybe we would have a silver salmon run in in August that was pretty healthy and they thought, oh, God, oops, sorry, my radio's on. Um, and, and so they would kind of take advantage of the fact that some of the larger male bears had had left for other fishing grounds. But um, that's part of it and the change in the timing of the salmon, but something for us to enjoy all these bears here. Yeah, and going back to like as recently as, as 2015, uh, I can remember that okay. summer really as the summer in August, at least when 284 was probably the only bear that we would regularly see. There seemed to be just like enough salmon for her to make a living uh, at the river in August then, while all the other bears were elsewhere. Um, so bear management was focused on 284, or excuse me, not 284, 2, 273, excuse me. And we were yeah. speculating um, about how this, the, um, the blonder bear in the, on the left-hand side of the, of the page here uh, might be... Um, 273. Uh, but since that time, yeah, the number of bears that have been making a living at Brooks Falls has just, uh, at, at the river has just continued to grow. And it's really uncommon just to see, um, you know, the, the, one of the elder statesmen of Brooks River here, Otis, sticking around. He usually finds uh, a different place to fish in August, but he's sticking around this year. Yeah, his, um, and I was there last night watching him and he, you know, was fishing, fishing, fishing. And um, apparently um, a lot of uh, the devoted bear cam viewers in different time zones were watching overnight and he was still there. So um, the, uh, our elder statesman never sleeps apparently or sleeps in the river. And while we're getting a good look at Otis here, he's one of the older bears at Brooks River. He's not the oldest, probably not the oldest male, but probably not the, and, and, um, and there's probably an older female bear, but he's the, the oldest bear that we see on a regular basis. So he's about, you know, 25 years old or so. Um, and actually, Naomi, somebody was wondering, and this is a question submitted in advance, do you think Otis will be able to put on enough weight for hibernation, given that he showed up late this year? And that question comes from, uh, somebody uh, named Charlie and uh, Otis showed up very late in in July this year, far later than his usual. He usually is kind of like an early uh, July uh, bear, but he didn't show up until very late. Um, so what do you think about that question? Do you think he'll be able to put on enough weight before hibernation? Well, he, he's, he's certainly working hard at it. He's got, the difference between, um, I wish I had uploaded um, a photo that I took last night. He, um, uh, he's got a belly on him. He's been working hard uh, since he came here and you could see his ribs when he showed up. And, um, but he has a belly on him. And um, I think he might just, 
put on enough weight to go hibernate, don't you, Mike? I think so. As long as there's, he doesn't experience some other health issue that would prevent him from eating, uh, he's already gained uh, quite a bit of body mass since we la since he showed up in in late July. So, and uh, he, you know, illustrates in a sense how much weight bears can gain over a short period of time. Uh, since he showed up so thin, and he had already shed some of his fur, I think it was pretty easy to see how thin he was when he arrived. And some other bears in in early summer can be very thin as well, but they maybe maybe haven't shed their fur, so it's a little bit harder to pick up on just how how lean they actually are. But Otis, yeah, he seems to be filling in really well. But it, it's he's also carrying his body mass just a little bit different than a lot of the other bears. Well, a bear like Walker, if you see him out of the water right now, he's kind of like a balloon um, around, <laughs> sort of like his hindquarters. It's really 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 big. Uh, Otis seems to be putting it all in his belly. Like he has a really low hanging belly. Uh, and I don't know if that's just because Otis hasn't, you know, he doesn't move around as much. So he's not, um, you know, he doesn't have the muscle mass that other bears do in their, in their, um, you know, towards their shoulders or their, their arms, their front paws, for instance, and, and their upper body area. I'm not sure, but it does seem like Otis is putting on weight in, um, in a, in a kind of a different way compared to these other bears. But I think we'll see him uh, uh, fatten up quite nicely um, heading through August and into September. So Mike, I have a question for you related to that. Um, we do see bears put on weight in different places. For instance, 32 chunk, um, although he gets a big belly, um, his uh, derriere is more like 151, very bulbous. Um, whereas 747 and Otis seem to fill out around the belly. Um, is there any research into how that might affect their health? Not that I'm aware of. It's an interesting thing to ponder, though, how uh, bears put on body mass in different ways. Um, I know there's been research on how different types of foods allow bears to gain different types of body mass. For instance, like if you're eating a, um, a diet that's really high in protein, that's not going to help you gain fat, um, but it's going to help you put on muscle mass. So for instance, um, during the um, Changing Tides uh, series of studies that was done on the Katmai Coast, uh, Pacific Coast a few years ago, um, they ended up finding that uh, several female bears were able to gain a lot of muscle mass in late spring and early summer prior to the salmon arriving, which was a bit of, su of a surprise. I think to, according to some biologists, you know, prior to that, they were thinking that a lot of these bears uh, just sort of hung around uh, and waited for the salmon to arrive before they started to gain weight. But they found that they were able to gain the, the smaller bears, like females were able to gain weight by eating things like uh, protein rich sedge that was just sprouting up. Uh, so grazing on sedge like grass um, and like like a cow would and, and gaining weight there. And also by digging clams too on the coast. Uh, but that's not going to help you survive hibernation because um, you, you bears are reliant on, on fat reserves for that. So these late summer foods that are really high in fat and also in sugar, if they're eating berries, for instance, that's really what's going to help bears gain the, the fat body mass that they need to survive hibernation because fat is the fuel that they use when they're in hibernation. It's not necessarily their muscle mass. If they're burning a lot of muscle in hibernation, that means they're probably experiencing some other health issue or they're, um, they're just, they just don't have enough fat to, to um, sustain them through hibernation itself. So high, high fat food sources like salmon and high sugar food sources like berries, that's really like gonna be the thing that helps them gain um, fat mass quicker than, than anything else. Huh. It, seeing Otis surrounded by gulls and uh, talking about um, uh, content of food. So um, Bear 903, um, who uh, some of the camp viewers like to call Gully because he has added gulls to his diet. Um, I'm wondering, that can't have, gulls can't have a lot of fat on them. That can't help be helping that bear get fat. I wouldn't imagine that they do. I mean, they're, they're, they will migrate, you know, kind of long distances, but um, not to the extent like something like a, 
Oh, like I'm trying to think of some of the real long distance migrants across um, the like Pacific turns. too. Like, uh, yeah, like uh, there's there there's a shorebird um, that flies basically direct, um, sometimes all the way from, or several species of shorebirds that will fly from Alaska straight to like China, for instance, or or even beyond um, without stopping. And and to be able to do that, you have to have a very high ratio of of body fat to, to lean tissue. And they, when they get to their destinations, they basically have no fat reserves left. They expend all of that energy. So that's, um, so those migratory stopovers at wintering sites are extremely important um, to those animals, but gulls. Yeah. I don't think that they, they really fatten up in the same way um, since they're uh, looking to eat, you know, they're uh, throughout the, the fall and winter season and they don't undertake those, those incredible endurance, um, migrations like like some of the some other birds will so we have some uh i see 801 there just so for fish and in um near the office near the far wall is bear 151 walker who's been there for quite a while this morning and we have a family group above him i can't quite see who that is no, I'm not quite sure as, uh, either. I think um, 128 Grazer was on the lip for a little bit just at the beginning of the broadcast. She may have moved to the far side. We know that um, another female with yearlings, 284, has been in that vicinity today. And then another year, or a female with yearlings, uh, 854 Divot, has been also in the vicinity. So this, the blonde ears over there make me think that that's Grazer. Um, yeah, as opposed those headlights. To maybe two. Yep. <laughs> But it could be, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll probably get a, a closer look as, if the family sticks around. But two big adult males in that far pool over there, kind of avoiding one another, not really looking to um, confront each other. And that's another thing that's been interesting to watch over the, the past couple of weeks or so. Um, and I think you've been able to get a really good look at this um, in person, Naomi, when you've been at the falls, is, is the overall tolerance that the bears are showing for, for each other. Yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting. As as crowded as it's been getting, um, there has been an overall tolerance. It seems like most of the grumbling is happening between sub-adults um, or um, any bears that are trying to steal fish from other bears. Um, and of course, those tend to be the bears with um, the least sway in um, the dom dominance hierarchy. So. Um, they're doing their best to get as much fish as they can. And so that sometimes ends up in fights. There's also been a little grumbling on the lip of the falls too, uh, for space and um, relationships sorting out. There's, and there was just an, a little bit of an example of that, um, you know, maybe 30 seconds or so ago between the, the two bears that are closest to us on the lip of the waterfall. Uh, downstream of the falls, you know, in the plunge pools, those can be productive places to fish, but we're seeing um, many young bears and also families um, compete for space on the lip of Brooks Falls. Uh, so you'll see sometimes bears queue up almost in a sense, waiting for another bear to move out of the way before going in. Or sometimes you'll see bears challenging, um, uh, you know, competitors for uh, access uh, to the lip of Brooks Falls. And there's one bear in the middle right now. We can barely see that bear, Naomi, but a very young one. Um, it looks like that's that's right up there against uh, the the edge of the falls in between those two larger bears. So finding a little bit of space there and not backing down to the grumblings of that, that larger bear that's sort of on the foreground of the lip. Yeah, I mean, I don't know who that small bear is, and I was watching that bear last night. Ooh, it's getting a little uh, interference there. But um, quite impressive that such a small bear is as tenacious on the lip of the falls um as it is so we're getting a better look at the family group back there any idea mike yeah this does this remind me of um of 128 grazer and her two yearlings her yearlings are evenly colored uh they they have a a, a fur color and ear color that closely resembles mom although they're not identical in their fur and ear color they're they're pretty close to mom. So um, the other families that I mentioned before, um, like especially Divot, um, there she has one uh, 
sort of uh, dark chocolate colored yearling and one lighter yearling. So that's kind of an easy way to, to tell them apart. Interesting though, that Grazer's not trying to assert um, her space, uh, you know, here, you know, either trying to gain access to a better fishing spot. She will fish the far pool from time to time. Although we see it, we've been seeing her on the lip of the falls more often than anything else. Uh, but maybe she just sees these other bears and doesn't want to tangle with them. You know, it's, it, it was, it's been interesting watching her on the falls for the last couple of days. We can see them in the woods directly above that bear that's in the water. Um, I'm just so curious why she's there. That's a place where she likes to tree her cubs for safety. So it's just interesting. But she, um, the last couple of times I've been at the falls, she has not been as successful in catching fish as um, some of the other bears, like uh, Bear 806, who she has been catching fish one after another. Catch a fish, eat it. Catch a fish, eat it. And I saw a grazer almost begging from her two nights in a row. So I something's going on with grazer that's different, and I don't know what it is. She's not catching as many fish at the falls. She's been um, almost begging, not quite. Um, so a bear to watch in the coming days, I think. I will say, though, uh, no one should be concerned about grazer's overall condition. Because she's fat and her <laughs> yearlings are quite large. I mean, they're they're big yearlings for this time of the year. I would be shocked if they're less than 200 pounds in size. They're really big. Uh, she's done an excellent job in caring for them. I mean, it, it's hard to see them in the trees here and get a get a a good a good look at them um, and and see just how how large they are overall. But yeah, she has done an excellent job in raising her yearlings. And some of those, uh, at least one of them, if not both, has have caught fish on their own on the lip of the falls, which is a skill that young bears usually don't learn until they're independent of their mother. Uh, so if these uh, two, two yearlings come back, if they're separated from mom at the normal time next year, we might see them go straight to the lip as long as they can find space and, and find success there quickly. One of them, that the one that is intent on fishing, last night was um, uh, trying to catch fish uh, just um, where the, under where the fish ladder is and um, wasn't quite figuring out how to do it, but it was gonna try. Now I wonder if 151 Walker is gonna stick around there with Grazer above him. They've had a few um, words this year. They certainly have. And Grazer has, for the most part, asserted her dominance over 151 just because she is so defensive. So I'm going to, uh, you know, bring up a photo here of 151. Uh, he is a, a fairly large adult male, over a thousand pounds in the fall. Um, he's been asserting himself around, uh, around other adult males frequently this summer, but he tends to give uh, 128 grazer her space um, and this is her earlier in the season before she gained um, all the body mass that you see on on her now uh, so female bears can punch above their weight if they are um, assertive and defensive and, and grazer i think really demonstrates that Down at the riffles, uh, there was a little bit of play action going on before. It looks like most bears are just kind of hovering uh, at the moment. I, I suspect, Naomi, just based on the overall, I don't know if I if this is the right term to describe it, but laissez-faire sort of attitude of the bears um, suggests that they are well-fed overall as a population. I mean, we'll, we will see bears working harder, some bears working harder than others. To, to catch their fish but we're not seeing a lot of bears running through the water charging through the water um, like they're desperately hungry it seems like they're mostly moving through the water scavenging for salmon or waiting at the waterfall looking for um, uh, looking for salmon to come to them yeah there were um, scraps last night and that's the first time in a while 
that I've seen the bears hydrating and hydrating is uh, when they start to get fussy about what they're eating because they've had enough to eat and they uh, just eat the fattiest parts of the fish and there haven't been a lot of uh, salmon fillets and scraps around but last night I was seeing that the um, the bears were all the bears were eating and that was really good to see now that we're getting a better look at this um, group of bears here on the riffles camera and again this is about 100 yards downstream of the falls looks like this is um, divot here with her two yearling cubs so we got a glimpse of 128 on the far side of the of the waterfall and you can see how blonde her ears were and her her yearlings how blonde their ears were um, and kind of uh, roughly uh, have the same fur color. Divot, um, her, she has one darker uh, yearling, and that one seems to be quite independent. We'll see, and that one just moved out of frame, so looking for salmon <laughs> elsewhere. And her lighter colored yearling seems to be less independent, but still is showing a propensity to kind of look for um, their, their own food. So each one of these bears, um, these families especially, you can see at this time of the year, uh, the yearlings start to develop um, more or less, uh, you know, uh, an independence that uh, is is interesting to see because you you don't necessarily see that in younger bears like spring cubs. Yeah, and if you get a chance on the cams to look at get close ups of Divot and her cubs, their head shapes are very similar. Sometimes we see some physical attributes um, like grazers' ears um, or Divot's head shape. Um, that, you know, we can see passed along uh, to the Cubs, not, not just their coloring, but, um, or 284 has a, um, a significant hump and both her Cubs this year have humps. So if you get a chance to get a closer look at Divot and her Cubs, see if you can take a look at their uh, head shapes. And back up at the falls, one bear that had been fishing, uh, I think near the jacuzzi has caught a fish and has devoured almost all of it. Um, it brought it to the, to the bank, uh, stripped the skin off, and just started from the tail down to the head to eat virtually everything that it could. So it signifies again that this bear is hungry today, maybe hasn't caught that many salmon, and is not likely to leave many scraps behind. The gulls, of course, are being their, uh, their hopeful selves, being in the right place at the right time to look for an opportunity to scavenge any uh, leftovers. And sometimes on, on days like today, when the bears aren't catching a lot of fish, we'll see the gulls competing uh, quite, um, quite vigorously for, for salmon. And I wish I could figure out how gulls establish dominance over each other. It seems like uh -huh. almost like the one that shows up last is the one that gets the fish. I mean, you'll see them. Uh, I, I, need, I need to do more um, reading on the behavior of gulls. I think it'd be quite, kind of fascinating to learn how they sort that out. And we've had Osprey around too, uh, catching fish in the lower river, which has been fun to watch. It's been interesting to me as we look at, um, you know, four bears on the, on the top of the waterfall right now, uh, about probably just about as many as are as are below how you know these bears are really looking to compete for the one or two spots where salmon jump uh, and to catch them there rather than trying to fish the um, the plunge pools below Brooks Falls because there's um there's a lot of you know micro niches where people where bears can fit in at Brooks Falls but there's more of them at the base of the falls than on the top of the, of the waterfalls. So I think it, it, in a way it, it illustrates how bears, you know, once they find something that works, they are likely to try, try that, that technique again and again, although we'll see bears moving from place to place. They really do, um, are, are creatures of habit and, and they're willing to, to risk being very close to other bears if they know that there's, that there's a, an opportunity for for more food and you see that younger bear right now that you're going to be trying to squeeze in there but maybe not finding mm -hmm. the same amount of space it had before yeah but persistent so i have a question mike on the left side of the screen and that sort of plunge pool there um 
sometimes I notice younger bears trying to fish there and and sometimes they do and 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 try a variety of fishing techniques have you noticed any successful fishing techniques in that area usually only at high densities uh, of mm -hmm. salmon i should say uh that bear in the at the base of the jacuzzi right now i mean that's in some deep water there uh yeah <laughs> i you know um when it's probably standing on its hind legs to um, I think that's how deep the water is in in that spot. So, but it's holding its ground. It's right, <laughs> right in a place. I don't think I've seen a bear try to hold its ground in that exact spot before, but you know, again, like, as you were talking about yeah. with the examples of how bears nice. try different, different places. I mean, yeah, it's, it's, um it's quite fun to watch. We'll see if this bear uh, is successful over the next, um, few minutes there but yeah it's probably standing on its hind legs that's uh in that in that spot it, let's see if it can get out of there <laughs> it looked very surprised <laughs> at the depth the one time that i was in the jacuzzi in that spot um and i want to make it clear to everybody that was at a time of the year when bears are not using the waterfall to fish so the the waterfall was free of bears I wanted to um, investigate how deep the jacuzzi was, so I kind of walked along the base of the of the waterfall, and uh, and I kind of let go near where that bear below the falls is, and I was tumbled around like a like a rag in a washing machine. So I, I was I was surprised by how strong the hydraulic was in there, the circulation of the water, and I was spit out. I probably was only in there for a couple of seconds, but it felt like a lot longer. It was a very disorienting experience and. And for me, that helped me understand and appreciate um, the uh, the ability of salmon to navigate those strong currents. And then now, also, you know, looking at the the strength of the bear uh, in in the in the water, being able to withstand the force of the water, it'd be very difficult for a person to stand, I think, in that spot without um, you know having to do a lot of work um, to swim uh, and and hold hold your ground in that location. So the bear trying a different fishing technique, knowing that salmon circulate in the water there, trying maybe looking for a salmon to jump right towards its mouth, or maybe it's um, going to try to grab a salmon in the water. Hard to say. I mean, when you, you see that and you realize how deep and how strong that water is, I think it gives you an indication of one reason why we don't see as many female bears there, because they are um generally much smaller than the males and it takes a lot of heft to hold your own and fish in there you know the small bears when they get into the jacuzzi you can see the force of the water pushing them away maybe they don't quite know how to stand, stand or sit um, in that in that location and that could work against um, their efficiency in that spot but the, one of the bears on the lip of the waterfall uh, just caught a, a salmon not that long ago and is and is eating it now. Uh, it's it's much easier for smaller bears, I think, to withstand the force of the water when they're standing on the lip of the falls once they learn where to place their feet. I mean, that can be tricky for them at first. But once they learn where to stand, then, yeah, they can they can definitely do it. Um, So that maybe that's another reason why we're seeing more um, smaller and younger bears fishing on the lip of the falls. Let's take a look at the, the riffles here, Naomi, because it's giving us a really great view of the lip of the falls. Mm. And it's, it's hard from the Brooks Falls camera to get a perspective on how far down the waterfall the bears are standing, but they are, they are leaning over the edge of the waterfall as far as they can. I mean, their front feet are just inches away from the cusp of, of the falls itself. And we're seeing a younger bear there. I'm wondering, seeing a few bears. I'm, I'm not gonna speak yet. I have a guess at, at who, who that younger bear might be. And, and Otis is still there. Yeah, Otis, um, downstream of the jacuzzi, um, below the three bears that are fishing on the lip of Brooks Falls, a bunch of other bears circulating around. I wonder if that's Divot and her yeah. um, two that have come into view on the island there. 
Otis hasn't made a move to displace or even fish the jacuzzi over the last, I'd say, at least 30 minutes, if not an hour. He moved away from his fishing spot on the far side of Brooks Falls well before the broadcast started. Uh, it's it's a little odd to me if he is hungry, why he's not going into that, that spot. Maybe he's just biding his time. Maybe he doesn't want to deal with the competition that other bears face. Maybe he's looking to scavenge some of the other opportunities. But again, o- Otis is an opportunist. Um, and he's adaptable. I think we've seen that over the years, certainly. As he has aged and he's had to face competition from younger bears, it seems like he's been able to do it quite well just by utilizing his patience and his fishing skill. Like he, he's, he's really good at catching fish. He's been doing so for more than 20 years. So when there's other bears you know, occupying his preferred fishing spots, it seems like he knows he can bide his time. And when those opportunities to fish at the falls uh, present themselves, he can get right in there and um, and catch uh, a lot of fish in short order, as long as the fish are there. Oh, that bear got a fish. Congratulations. <laughs> it did, yeah. Uh, again, that's kind of a, a great thing to see, that bear so deep in the falls catching fish. Again, it's uh, an uncommon um, fishing location. Uh, and it's odd that it's in there trying to eat the, eat the fish, but maybe it's found the right spot to stand and doesn't have to work that hard for it. You know, usually when bears oh, are in really deep water, unless the water's calm, I mean, they're moving to um, to a, a shallower spot to eat, its, eat eat their catch. Even 747 moves out of there to eat his catch. But maybe that bear can't figure out how to get out of there with the fish in its mouth. <laughs> yeah, there it goes, trying to find another place to, to eat its catch. Yeah, found a rock. That's good. Bears on the far side of the falls finding success now. It looks like uh, 151 Walker, who is over there in the shadows, really against the far wall, um, just caught a salmon. Another bear on the lip caught a salmon. And we're more than halfway through our broadcast so far today. Um, And I'd like to thank everyone for joining me. Uh, My name is Mike Pitts, the resident naturalist with Explore.org, and my co-host for this play-by-play is Ranger Naomi Boak from Katmai National Park. Naomi, while um, you know we're looking around at a lot of bears here, there was some pretty interesting bear activity recently uh, that I think we talked about highlighting or, or at least discussing uh, during the broadcast today. Do you want to uh, take a look at some of the clips that we saw, or at least things that happened Friday or and uh, and over the weekend? Sure. All right, so let's uh, first here, let's go to number 909 and her cub. I'll pause this here for just a second to set this up. So this is um, a family, number 909 and her first year cub uh, on sort of the other side of the grass eating a salmon with a bear approaching them. Naomi, were you able to see this live or just have you just seen the replay? No, I've just seen the replay, but I've watched uh that family group a lot um at, at the fall so i've i've seen um i've observed the behavior of of the mother and the cub a lot so we can talk about that once we look at this all right so we'll play this through because it's interesting to see what the cub does that's really the behavior that you want to pay attention to here 909 with a fish her cub right next to her and then this other bear approaching that vicinity can even hear a little bit of the people reacting on the wildlife viewing platform of uh, towards uh, the reaction of that cub uh, running off that larger bear. And that's not something that you see quite often. I've seen it maybe a couple of other times within my experience at Brooks River, but the cub, you know, perhaps realizing, hey, you know what? I don't like this other bear that's so close to me. I know mom's got my back. Maybe I'm going to assert myself over that larger bear, but that's a surprising thing to see. Most of the time, mom is taking the lead and defending uh, the family's space. Yeah, it is unusual. I mean, I remember, um, and probably um, a lot of the cam viewers who have been watching for a while remember uh, 273's spring cub doing something similar, although 273 intervened and uh, got between the cub and the uh the attempted steal, but um, 
that that cub um it's very interesting because um 909 is a young mother and she tries to tree or um keep her cub on on the bank but that cub doesn't like to be treed and as soon as mom gets a fish the cub comes from wherever it's been treed or on the bank and goes to mom and it's almost behaving like it's kind of used to being slightly independent because mom is young it's her first litter doesn't quite know what to do um but that was that was a pretty wonderful clip and again a contrast between divot and her family so this is a54 divot um and her two um her two yearlings uh you can see the the color difference in the in the cubs and also, we talked about it before, the independence level that they'll, they'll show. Um, it seems like the darker cub is a bit more independent than, than the lighter one. Uh, it'll be fascinating, I think, to follow 909 next year, Naomi, and see how that, that cub uh, matures and whether it's still willing to assert itself uh, next year or if it's going to be maybe more well-fed and, and, and more relaxed about it. But fun stuff to see each one of these families, each one of these bears, uh, behaves as an individual. They make individual decisions uh, about how they're going to navigate the the competition that they face for for space and food at the waterfall. Yeah, yeah. I mean, even the way the two cubs with divot are positioned right now, that lighter cub is always staying, almost always staying very close to mom. And so, Mike, is there a um, a difference might a singleton become a little more independent um, than uh, cubs that have siblings? I'm not sure. It would be it, it'd be interesting to try to study that. I'm not. It, it'd be difficult maybe to to do so. Um, but I, I think if we, you know, the bear cams can give us you know that opportunity because they're watching these bears more than any one person can do. So we have the hive mind working. So I think it would be, it's interesting for the bear cam audience collectively to try to pay attention to that. Like, what are you seeing in some of these younger bears? Are you seeing greater levels of independence for certain siblings of certain litters? Um, and also how does that translate into those bears, uh, those, those cubs behaviors as they uh, mature into their sub adult years, their teenage years and into adulthood as well. And also how those relationships are carried into the future. Uh, right now we're actually seeing something really interesting, um, Naomi, divots yeah. and yearlings are taking the lead in approaching another bear who has a salmon. Yeah. Divot usually doesn't like that very much. Let's see what happens. Divot's not a fish stealer either, but sometimes, you know, again, families, mother bears with older cubs are more dominant than some other bears. And I've seen mother bears with older cubs sometimes steal fish from bears that they couldn't steal fish from if they were, if each one of the, the, the bears in that family were single. Uh, so Divot right now is stepping in between <laughs> her, her yearlings and that other bear. That other bear didn't look like it really gave up any salmon, but it was certainly wary of the approach of, of those three bears. Wise move. Because we've seen Divot chase off bears much larger than her in recent weeks, like 151 Walker and 32 Chunk. And it looks like a, a independent juvenile bear, those bears that we call sub-adults, um, that was moved just out of the frame not that long ago. Um, because I think of the pro close proximity of Divot and her yearlings. So one of the, or both of the yearlings walked toward that other bear and another other bear said, no, I don't want to be close to these, to this family. It's just being a little, it's a little too close to comfort. And it looks like okay, maybe two, now and another, another family on the far side, it looks like 128 has returned to the river. Mm -hmm. So let's see what happens with these four cubs I, I don't know that i think these are two family groups that don't necessarily play a lot with other family groups um i know that one of grazer's cubs has begun to play with uh bear 806's cub but um 
and they have two more protective mothers than than some of the other sows with cubs. Play between siblings, related siblings, is is common. Play between mother and her cubs is common. Play between cubs of different litters isn't so common. Although we've been seeing it at the river, I think in, in many instances, it's been conspicuous this year uh, and last year. So that's been interesting to watch. Uh, you know, sometimes people will wonder, well, you know, can these bears recognize, you know, each other? Do they remember each other from day to day or, or year to year? And I'm, I'm convinced that they can, especially across seasons. It seems like the cubs will recognize uh, if if they've had a, a good experience with um, another family, it seems like they will recognize that family again and be like, oh, well, maybe I can go over there and have a play date with them. And, and a lot of times mom is much more weirded out by this than the cubs themselves. We'll sometimes see the moms separate her cub from uh, from the other family, but she also has to be cautious in that situation too because she doesn't want to irk the uh, the defensiveness or provoke the defensiveness of the other mother bear. Uh, it doesn't look like these um, this or these families right now are gonna play with one another, but that's something to watch for on the cameras. We've been seeing a little bit of that this year. Yeah, no, um, we, we saw clearly relationships that um, were established last year between uh, certain family groups have continued this year, like 435 Holly's Cub, playing with 806's cub and they played together last year. And um, again, bears as individuals, um, very different personalities. Um, 806's cub is very forward, um, very social, very curious, um, made the approach to grazers cubs this year and had to have a quote bear discussion with grazer um, before 806's cub was was actually allowed to approach Grazer's Cub, but um, uh, they've been playing together on the lip of the falls to get. So um, um, it's interesting, again, different personalities of individual bears, starting very young. It's also interesting to me that Grazer, who's at upper left, um, and Divot aren't, you know, in a more productive fishing spot. You know, the, the, they're, where they're standing, again, sort of on the, on the far side of the, of the river, they can scavenge for fish there at really high salmon densities. They can chase salmon there, but the, um, they're not in the very productive fishing spots overall. Maybe that indicates, again, that they're, they're well fed, um, at least for today. A little bit of play um, in between Divot and one of her yearlings just now. So, yeah, gentle uh, jawing and maybe pawing at one another. While the is rest that, of the bears that are in that Grazer's, are, speaking of independence, is that Grazer's cub all the way on the right? I think it might be. Um, I kind of lost bears in the shuffle as I was looking at um, different webcam views and trying to think about what we might talk about next. But yeah, definitely well downstream of mother if it is. And mother doesn't seem too concerned. Um, at the beginning of the year, though, Naomi, that would not have flown with, with Grazer. Um, she probably would have kept her cubs closer and if any bear was in the near vicinity and the cub showed any sort of stress because of that she would have charged right after the other bear grazer has a reputation among the other bears of, as being very defensive and it's and it's a, a well-earned reputation <laughs> speaking of competition for space though there's one more uh, clip that happened uh, late last week that I want to talk about. Uh, and it's kind of an interesting one because it has to do with the hierarchy at Brooks River and dominance and how bears resolve those conflicts and whether food, I think, plays into that or how well fed bears are. So let's, um, let's bring up this uh, video, Naomi, of late, I think on Friday. Um, so late Friday evening, Alaska time, maybe close to 11 p.m. Alaska time. Um, lots of bears at the waterfall. Uh, what I want to attention to is kind of like the bear who's right in the middle of the waterfall on the far side of the jacuzzi. That's uh, number 747. So he's uh, to the right of the bears on the lip of Brooks Falls. And there's another large male that's approaching him. 
what we're about to see here is a little bit surprising considering the uh, the level of dominance that 747 has displayed over the summer. He's been the, the river's most consistently dominant bear uh, this year, but he's getting some growling ex um, from the other bear who's 469, an older adult male, probably older than Otis, but fat and looking in great condition this year. 469 approaches 747's vicinity. 469 growls uh, several times to let 747 know that he's willing to challenge him for that fishing spot. 747 doesn't seem to really growl back, just gives him a glare. Then eventually here, we'll see um, 747 just kind of step out of the way as 469 inches into that location. Four six nine being persistent here in his approach and, and eventually getting the message across. And you can see right now seven four seven just walking away from that fishing spot. Let's take a look at another view of this from the main falls cam. The falls cam was looking downstream uh, prior to that, so it only really caught the tail end of it. But you can see seven four seven moving away from that fishing spot where he had been and in yielding that spot uh, to 2469. And Naomi, this is not something that, again, you can, I think that we would, could have predicted, um, you know, just a, just a week ago or so. I, you know, if, if someone would say, well, 469 is going to show up and he's going to um, take the opportunity to display 747, I'd be like, nah. I don't think that's likely to happen. 747 is younger. He's bigger. I don't think that's likely to happen. But we, we're seeing it here. So um, I'm, I'm curious to know your thoughts on the on this situation. Well, I mean, I think, well, there are a couple of things. One is that 747 is well fed right now. And um, again, when you're thinking about energy in, energy out, um, and uh, and the risk reward ratio well maybe just not worth it to um to uh posture for that fishing spot um the you know so it's a to me it's a situational analysis by the bear i also think it has to do with uh 747's personality um we for the last 10 years have are used to watching 856 being the most dominant bear. And I don't really think 856 would have allowed this to happen. 856 seemed to be a bear that need, needed to prove himself all the time and really carefully and consistently maintain his, his dominance. Um, 747 seemed to do that early in the season, but not so much now. He seems more relaxed. And I think that's a difference in the personality of the bears and also the situation with the salmon. Also, we talk about bears remembering each other. Um, there could be a history between 469 and 747. Don't know. Those are all great points. Um, and especially the one regarding how 747's disposition is not like 856. I mean, 856 was uh, a hyper dominant bear for most of a decade at the waterfall so um, he was unlikely to let other bears challenge him 747 although he is very dominant he is a bit more mild tempered especially now since he's so fat um, and is so well fed so he might think you know uh, it's just it's just not worth it if this other bear is going to put up you know um you know a ruckus and he's he's willing to you know to get my face for this fishing spot i'm gonna have it i'm gonna let them let them have it i've already eaten you know so many fish today so whatever dude you can have it i i don't want to uh you know say that 469 is the most dominant bear at the river because he was only here for a few days this summer we really didn't see him interact with a whole lot of other bears it'd be more interesting i think to see and watch for this later in the fall to see if those bears interact with one another and also next spring too to see if 469 shows up uh, 
earlier in the year at the beginning of the salmon run when bears are competing for uh, the preferred fishing spots because they're very hungry at the time and it's still the tail end of the mating season and whether um, you know we see the same interactions uh, resolve themselves or similar interactions resolve themselves in the same way so but an interesting to see otherwise um, 469 an older bear um, much older than the two that we're looking at right now, Naomi, um, 151 Walker, he's in kind of in his mid teens and 801, probably just based on his side, his size, he's probably about that same age, although we're not sh quite sure. We don't have a, a great idea on how old he is. He just showed up as an adult a few years ago. Yeah, no, I mean, again, the opportunity to explore gives us to watch these bears over years because they have and or build relationships between each other over years. Um, they're individuals, their personalities change. Look at 856 this year compared to last year. We don't know why his personality is so different this year. We don't know if it's injury or age, but we have this amazing opportunity to observe these bears under so many different circumstances over such a long time. And I think what we've discussed and, and seen here today is a, you know some really good examples of that. These are two bears that we would typically have expected to disperse away from the river by now. But like we talked about at the beginning of the broadcast, it's surprising to see so many bears still fishing at Brooks Falls and finding a lot of fishing success uh, for the middle of August. Um, again, this is not something that I learned to expect uh, when I first was, you know, had the opportunity to work at Brooks River as a ranger in 2007, 2008, 2009. There are hardly any bears around the river in, in August. But patterns are shifting, bear behavior is shifting, their individuality helps, um, and their ability to learn, I think, uh, helps them adapt to these uh, to these different situations. And it's, it's really been uh, wonderful to watch over um, the past few weeks, especially. Looking again at the waterfall from our Riffles camera, um, Divot has moved to, to the top of the falls and Otis is now eating a fish downstream of the falls. So he sat basically in that area, uh, Naomi, the, this whole uh, broadcast, and I'm not sure if he's eating just a scrap or one that he caught on his own, but um, it's, uh, you know, it was worth his while to sit there because now he's um, getting getting a little bit of, of, a reward, of a reward. And we just have a few minutes left in our broadcast. Um, I've talked about some of my takeaways, you know, uh, to, to think about as, as we leave the viewers today with, with the bears, thinking about the individual of the bears, how they adapt to different situations and the gathering of bears at Brooks Falls and how that's so surprising for this time of the year. Uh, do you have any other thoughts on what we've seen so far today? Well, I've thought about what to look for in the next couple of weeks. I mean, I was pretty surprised to be at the falls and see and count 31 bears in sight last night on August 8th. Um, and the salmon run was late this year. It was three weeks later than usual. So I'm curious, will we continue to get a salmon run for another week or so? Um, or will it diminish? What's the silver salmon run going to be like this year? Will all that be enough to keep more bears at the falls um, than before? And then when will bear, more bears start to leave and go to those little creeks where they can um, get, get those bunches of spawned out salmon? And then the other thing that I'm thinking, I'm thinking about the future and what's gonna happen about the lower river, which is currently the water level is really high, which is one reason we're seeing a lot of family groups here. So all things to keep watching for um, in the, uh, the saga, the soap opera of the Brooks River. Absolutely. Um, never the same day on Bear Cam. So um, please continue to watch, share your insights with the other webcam viewers in the comments and share it um, you know, with us. We'd love to, to hear about your observations and learn about what you have seen. And, and that helps me to learn more about the, the behavior of, of the animals overall. We have some uh, great live events planned for everybody 
coming up this week as well. So Naomi and I have a Q and A um, in the comments tomorrow from five to seven p.m. Eastern time. Naomi, you also have a live chat um, tomorrow as well, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, I have a live chat about the mystery of the magic behind the curtain. It's our Wizard of Oz chat about the tech of the, the bear cams. Yeah, so uh, tune in for that tomorrow. I think, do you remember what time that is? I, it escapes me. I think it'll be uh, 3 p.m. Alaska time, 4 p.m. Okay. Pacific time. And I'll be talking to Candace Rush, who is head of media for Explore, and uh, Joe Pfeiffer, who is the chief field. Uh, technician for Explore and without whom none of this would happen. And then on Wednesday at 7 p.m. Eastern time at three o'clock Alaska time, I will be interviewing Leslie Scora, who is Katmai's wildlife biologist about the bear monitoring program at Brooks River and also um, her master's thesis that she just completed with that has some really interesting insights in it about the, the population of bears at Brooks River. So tune in for those broadcasts. Naomi, thanks so much for joining me today and sharing your insight today. Oh, it's always fun. And uh, thank you to the bears for putting on such a good show. Yeah, thanks for, to the bears for giving us the opportunity to have something to talk about instead of just water and a waterfall. My name is Mike Fitz <laughs> with explore.org. Thanks for joining me today. My co-host was Ranger Naomi Boak with Katmai National Park, and we will talk to you later.